Welcome everyone. Uh, so glad to have you with us today. I'm Karen with the marketing team at Raza. And today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at Raza Open Source 2.0, which was released last Thursday. Uh, so we have seven speakers uh, from across different teams at Raza. Um, that includes engineering, uh, research, and DevRel. And every one of these speakers has really played a key role in the development and the launch of the 2.0 release. Cool, uh, so let's, uh, I'll just take a moment to kind of introduce you to everyone. Uh, we've got Alan Nichol, who is our co-founder and CTO. Uh, we've got Vladimir, also known as Vova. Uh, and Doksh, who are both joining us from our research team. Alexander, AKA Sasha, uh, and Tobias are both representing the engineering department. Uh, and then Ella is a solutions engineer with our customer success engineering team. And when she's not helping customers build assistance, uh, she's working on our docs. Um, and then finally, we'll be hearing from Yusta, um, who many of you already know is our head of developer relations. Uh, so we've set aside a full 90 minutes for today's presentation. Uh, we're going to start off with an overview of the 2.0 release from Alan, uh, and then we'll be taking a closer look at individual features and updates. Uh, so one of the updates that kind of underpins everything else is the switch to YAML format for training data. Uh, so we're going to start off there, um, and then we'll take a look at the rule policy with VOVA. Uh, Tobias is going to walk us through what's changed with forms, as well as a new feature that we call suggested config. Uh, and then Docs is up next with some exciting updates on retrieval intents. And then we'll walk through what has changed in the documentation alongside the 2.0 release. Um, and then finally, Yusta will lead us through the process of migrating from an older version of Raza Open Source 2.0. Uh, and we'll go over how the community can get involved and share feedback. Uh, and then lastly, we'll wrap things up with a panel style Q&A session um, and that will feature the entire team. All right, so as you can see, we have a lot of exciting content to cover, uh, but before we get to it, let's go over a few housekeeping notes for today's webinar. So first you'll notice that all participants are muted uh, you can participate and ask questions using the Q&A window, which you can find in your control bar. Uh, we'll hold all of the questions until the end, but you can submit your question at any point during the webinar. Uh, so you don't need to wait until the end to send your question in. We'll go ahead and add all of those questions to our list and we'll answer as many of them as we have time for during the live broadcast. Um, and then last but not least, we are recording this webinar today. Um, so we will post the recording on YouTube as soon as we have it edited, usually takes a few days, um, and we'll also send it out to everyone by email. And in that same email, you'll get a short survey. Uh, we would absolutely love your feedback on today's presentation. Um, and so with that, um, Alan, I will hand things over to you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. Hope everyone can hear and see me okay. And Thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. I you know, have the great pleasure of kicking things off and providing a, a little bit of context. Um, and then you're gonna hear from all the great people who, who made this release happen. So um, starting off with the big picture, you know, why does Raza exist? So if you can go to the next slide, Karen. Cool. Um, so our mission at Raza is, uh, to empower all makers to create AI assistants that work for everyone. And I think that's important to really see the benefit of this technology. One, it has to get a lot better so that it really serves everyone who can be served by an AI assistant. Um, and then we have to make those tools available to everybody, right? And I think uh, 2.0 is making strides in both those directions. So both making Rasa easier to use and making it more powerful and more capable. And so to achieve our mission, we do three things. Um, we champion open source tools. That's obviously why we're here today talking about the 2.0 release of, uh, of Rasa open source. Um, we invest very heavily in our community. I'm sure you know, most of you are part of it and, and know how important community is to Rasa. And we do a lot of applied research and 
put the results of that research again back into the open source code base, right? And those are really, that's the strategy. Those are the three things we do uh, to accelerate uh, progress on our mission. And speaking of community, um, growth has been incredible since, uh, uh, since last year when we released the 1.0. Um, I mean, I think we saw a lot of that at the L3 AI conference back in June, but just the activity and the love and the sort of international nature of our community um, it blows my mind every day. So thanks everyone for, for being part of it. Um, it's absolutely crucial to Raza's success. So I'm gonna start with a couple of points about uh, Raza Open Source 2.0, and then I'll hand over and you'll get sort of deep dives into a bunch of the most important features from uh, research and engineering and um, other folks. So how did we get here, you know? Um, where we started and how it's going. Uh, almost four years ago, now we released the first uh, version of Raza NLU, which at the time was a drop-in replacement for Wit.ai or Lewis or Dialogflow. Um, and that was really the, the first thing that we shipped. Um, and the you know, reception at the time was just incredible. It was just exactly the thing that, that people needed. Um, we followed it up about a year later with uh, a new approach to building dialogue systems called Raza Core. And then we merged those two into a single code base just over a year ago when we released the 1.0 uh, version of Raza Open Source. And I can't even begin to describe to you how many sort of important um, conceptual changes and important sort of architectural changes have gone into making Raza Open Source 2.0 happen. But um, it's been an incredible effort from the team uh, to kind of unify a lot of concepts, reuse a lot of code and set us up for the future where uh, we can build even more powerful AI systems. And it's not just the team at Raza who put a massive amount of effort into making this happen, all of you did as well. So over the course of the summer, we had 11 pre-release versions. We had seven alphas uh, and four release candidates go out and well over 2000 of you uh, tried out early versions of Rouse Open Source 2.0, uh, let us know what was breaking, let us know what was confusing, gave us feedback on formats, all of that. I mean, we were just so incredibly grateful. Um, as I said, it wasn't a small feat either to get all the, uh, <laughs> get all the engineering done to get this release out. So um, well over 3,000 commits went into uh, the difference between if you're using 1.10 and if you're using 2.0. Uh, Raza open source. So thanks to everyone for, for making that happen. So one of the changes I wanted to quickly touch on is telemetry, which is a new thing we've added to Raza open source. And so what does it mean and why have we done it? So firstly, a uh, really important point is that telemetry is totally, you know, up to you and it's totally anonymous, right? Uh, what we found is that it's uh, extremely helpful for us to prioritize, you know, what features we need to maintain and put more effort into, um, you know, what pipelines are people using to help us kind of direct our research, what languages are people building uh, assistance in. So if you're interested in any of this, um, it's all sort of in the documentation, you can check out, you know, what telemetry we collect, that's all documented. Um, you can see the commands for enabling and disabling telemetry. Um, and all of you who, uh, you know, choose to uh, uh, opt in, thank you very much because it's uh, extremely helpful for all of us to make uh, Raza open source a better product. And I think just to be very clear, you know, the kinds of things and you can go check out what we do collect and what we don't, the kinds of things we do collect are, you know, how often are people training models? What languages are those models in? We never collect any personally identifiable data about you. We don't have your name or anything like that. Uh, we don't ever see any of your training data and we certainly don't ever receive any of the messages that the users send to your bot. Uh, another big change that's been kind of behind the scenes and you won't particularly notice, but uh, makes a big uh, change for us at Raza uh, is we did a lot of work to decouple the Raza open source and Raza X code bases. So what's changed here is that previously um, the Raza X code base would just kind of use any function, any module that it wanted to from Raza open source. Um, 
what we decided to do is we moved all the code that both of them need into a separate module called roundset.shared. Um, and that means we have a stricter contract of you know, things that are also used by other libraries. Um, and why we did this is in the future, it makes it easier for us to ship new Raza X versions without requiring you to upgrade to a new version of Raza open source, right? So for the last sort of year or so, very often, if you wanted to use the latest features in Raza X, you also had to retrain your models and use the latest version of Raza open source. And, um, you know, we're laying a lot of groundwork to making it so that it's no longer the case so that you, you don't always have to retrain and you can use uh, that a single Raza X version can uh, support multiple versions of browser open source. Then uh, version 0 0.33 of Raza X is imminent. <laughs> it's really on the verge of being ready to release. They're just final touches being put to it. And um, that's going to be fully compatible uh, with Raza open source 2.0 and will not be compatible with the 1.x or earlier versions. Um, and so it adds support for the new YAML training data, which you'll hear a lot about today. Um, it adds support for adding and editing rules, which are a new concept we've introduced in Rails Open Source 2.0. Um, and it adds full, full support for the response selector, uh, which has sort of graduated to being a, a stable feature. So lots of important and interesting changes, which you'll have uh, to play with very soon as well. So, I'll hand over um, to get straight into the features and you can get sort of deep dives uh, on all the different things that we've changed and all the new ideas. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sasha, who's going to tell you about YAML training data. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, my name is Alexander. Welcome, everybody. I just want to talk a little bit about YAML training data format as one of the most visible things that the 2.0 brought. And uh, I want to start first with uh, why we ever thought about changing the training data format. So uh, like in general, we want the training data format to be feature-proof means that we want all of our uh, new features that will come at some point, or maybe something that we didn't even think of yet to be expressible in the training data format that we have so that we want to have something that is extendable. And it's also very cool that the format is itself is standardized, meaning that uh, existing text editors and IDs, they would highlight it and support it properly. And uh, the third thing is it's very great if the format is actually human readable because um, I mean, sometimes, I think a lot of times, uh, users can just go through the, their training data and just want to see it and maybe fix it very fast. And um, in that sense, normal text, and text files work very good. And we want to continue doing this. And options that we had were continuing with a markdown, uh, going full JSON, or going full YAML. And we started to collect the ideas internally early this year. And just we had several months, I guess, of brainstorming. And at some point, we figure out that, OK, um, we have very good candidates. And yeah, we made a blog post and we reached out to the community. And basically, we, uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, like on 2nd of June, we collected all of our ideas together in one blog post and reached out to the community asking their opinions. So we had these three options, Markdown, JSON, or YAML. And it was pretty obvious to us that YAML is a clear winner in that situation. And yeah, it, it was exactly what we thought about this as well. And uh, basically, we went for YAML. We started to work on this, uh, bringing it live. And can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And yeah, basically, now, after 2.0, YAML is our new default training data format. And um, in the future, Markdown will be duplicated. It is fully compatible uh, now with 2.0, but we will put it to the deprecation mode, meaning that we would ask uh, everybody to migrate their training data uh, to the new format and uh, not introduce the one using Markdown. And all of our internal tools like interactive learning, initial projects, they already 
do things like create anti projects already in YAML. And I will talk a little bit later about the migration. And basically, uh, what is what are the good things about YAML? So uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it is human readable, and it is a standard format that um, like a lot of a lot of tools are using for configuration and other stuff. Even we internally already use YAML for, for example, domain.yaml and config YAML and endpoints YAML credentials. So basically, uh, it was just one step into one step further into this direction. And one of the great things that we were able to solve using YAML was um, the fact that we that users can now group their data in any um, in an arbitrary order. So basically, you can split your files, you can, you can split your NLU data, uh, you can keep the intents and synonyms and regex uh, separately if you want to, and you can also mix them with stories or keep the stories and rules in the next file in another file. So whenever, whenever before you had to uh, create two files, you can just basically put them all into one. So you can have your project just all of your training data of your project just in one file if it's a tiny project and you're fine with this. Um, yeah, basically uh, one another thing is uh, that we introduce here with YAML is uh, custom metadata. So there is a basically, not, I obviously not going to details too much, but if you want your training examples to have some very specific arbitrary information, you can have it now and it will be available in your NLU pipeline. And yeah, the, the great thing as well is YAML is very flexible for the future with we pretty confident currently so that um, we can express um, we can express our new ideas that our research team brings and we can express them in YAML. And you can see that already happening uh, with rules. Uh, the rules are something that will be spoken about later. Yeah. and. Uh, Speaking about YAML, continuing here, uh, one of the things that are maybe not that obvious, but still they happen, is that the domain is now also modular. And it means that you can split your domain into any amount of small domain files and use them just as one, which is, which is great. And we know that a lot of folks wanted this. And another thing is that our retrieval intent responses and bot utterances now share the same syntax and they can be defined in any file and retrieval and sense finally support the rich media. So you can touch buttons, images, and things like that. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention a little bit about the migration of the current data, because I know that since we say that we deprecate markdown can be like a little bit stressful, like, okay, what do we do with existing ones? So there is a, there, we provide tools to migrate your existing data from markdown or from JSON to the new YAML format. And basically, it's already existing commands, Raza, Raza Data Convert, NLU, NLG, and Core. NLG stands for, um, basically, it's uh, retrieval intents that we have. Yeah, and you uh, you can use, this is not, of course, the full syntax of these commands. You can just do minus minus help and see the full potential. But basically, these commands will convert, will take care of converting your existing training data to the YAML format. And yeah, the second thing is, uh, Rather data convert config, which will migrate your existing policies, excluding forms, which will be again spoken about a little bit later, um, because the forms still have to be migrated manually. Uh, yeah, and basically that's it. Uh, we are super happy that YAML is there. It took us some time to get it working, and uh, thanks a lot for everybody who contributed and tried this thing very fast when we were still in alpha because it helped us a lot and even major things like interactive learning for example support of yaml in interactive learning the first patch came actually from community when we were still in alpha three stage which is great yeah and now i just uh, hand over to vova speaking about the rule policy hi my name is vladimir and I'm, I'm going to introduce the rule policy. Uh, I must say it's a huge topic, so uh, I'll just, you know, cover the basis and uh, try to advertise it as much as possible. Uh, but I encourage you to actually go ahead and check our docs. We try to write um, extensive documentation about it and recommend when and when not to use it. 
and so on. Uh, but before uh, we go into detail how to use it, let's uh, look back and see what actually we had. We have in currently RAS open source 1.0. Uh, if you look through the policies, we, we have uh, five main policies, which is the full, uh, actually seven, but uh, the main ones are five, which is a fullback policy, which is modification to those two stage back, two stage fallback policy, a form policy, mapping policy, memorization, which can be a, a, like uh, another modification of memorization is augmented memorization policy and the third policy. And for example, they're all uh, can be used together in different variations. This is the example of the uh, policy configuration from our uh, SARA uh, bot that lives on the docs. Uh, and if you look carefully at this list of five policy, uh, one can notice that uh, three of them actually rule, like they define rule base. They do not, so to say, learn anything from the data. They define the the behavior that uh, a creator just imagine in their head, while the others are kind of try to learn some behavior from the data. So if we switch to the next slide, we can see that exactly that the, the first three is effectively they define the rules. And the last two is our machine learning policies. And here uh, I'm uh, you must ask why uh, memorization policy is suddenly a machine learning policy. Well, the thing is that, yes, technically, it just simply memorizes the data that we provide to, for it. But uh, it's not, uh, I, would, uh, I, I, I wouldn't consider it as a, rule po is a, is a rule policy because it just kind of a different, if, uh, if, if you want, a different machine learning algorithm to learn the data. Uh, it's 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 not uh, as so to say smart as the transformer that Ted uses, but it provides a certain uh, certain properties that we like. For example, that if during prediction we encounter exactly the same story as during training, then it will be executed uh, regardless of the of the of the behavior of the learning inside the Ted policy. However, it also poses the danger because. Uh, our stories are not identical. I, I wrote quite a bit of stories for various uh, various uh, bots or various tests, and uh, almost always my stories contain mistakes. And memorization policy is dangerous because it will simply memorize it, or it will not memorize something important because of one mistake. While TED policy has the ability to smoothen it out and uh, kind of find the, the, the true signal. Therefore, I don't consider memorization policy as a rule policy. However, the other three, they are. And the problem is with them that they predict the next action with some fixed probability which we defined and we arbitrarily put it to one, uh, which is very hard to decide which one is actually winning because it could happen that all three of them will predict something. And uh, we introduced this concept of, um, of priorities which is uh, that uh, memorization uh, that, uh, for example, form policy has the highest priority because the form policy predicts the form we need to execute it. And that created a lot of confusion. And actually at some point, uh, so we, when we introduced the priority, they were linear. Then at some point we needed to make them nonlinear. If, if form policy doesn't predict anything, but fall, fall, fallback policy predicts something, then it overrides mapping or vice versa. I don't remember there is like, uh, um, a condition there in the ensemble. And that gives the idea that basically they become entangled. Like when we, when we created them originally, they were more or less independent. But the more and more we added the capability to the form policy, to the mapping policy, we understood that they become entangled and that we need them to interact with each other. And also we need a better way to define the rules because mapping policy defines its rules inside the domain. Form policy has some rules that you need to remember because you don't really define data for form policy and fallback policy as well. You define it inside the configuration with all these uh, configs and so on and two-stage fallback policy as well. So instead we decided to erase all of that completely and introduce the new policy, which is called the rule policy, which kind of have all of these three together. So what is this rule policy is about? Uh, 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 yeah, so, and now we have only three policies. 
we still need, unfortunately, priorities because we still have immunization policy that predicts the, uh, the action with probability one. And so rule policy overrides the immunization policy. But the rest is actually very straightforward. So rule policy, the highest priority, if it predicts something, it predicts something. If it doesn't, then it's the, the fight between immunization and TED. TED always predicts something with the probability less than one because it's actual uh, softmax uh, uh, confidences and the minimization policy whether it whether predicts something or not. So uh, by introducing one policy, we at least introduce this, uh, we introduce back the straightforwardness of how different policies interact. And now we have only three policies, uh, which is said uh, like on the next slide. And uh, you can see that uh, the config uh, for, the, for the SARA, the new config for the SARA that is migrated to Rust 2.0 looks simpler. Uh, it has only two. It, it has only three policies, and the the fallback thing uh, needs to be defined for the rule policy because rule policy if it doesn't predict anything, uh, if if you have an option enable fallback prediction to true, it will predict the action default fallback or whatever action you, you you define there with the with the fallback threshold. And we need this fallback threshold here, it is 0 0.3, in order to overwrite the low confident TED policy prediction. Uh, and, that, that, and that's basically it. So let's see what rule policy, uh, like how to train or how to define actual rules for the rule policy. Uh, and what is rule policy? So rule policy, as I said, it it's combines all logic-based dialogue policies into single policy. Uh, uh, by introducing it, we first of all we reduce the number of concepts that you need to learn in order to create this policy. So you don't need to put trigger messages in the domain anymore. You don't need to create separate separate fallbacks and so on. You all create in a in a, in a, so we introduce the new story format, so to say. They look exactly like stories. They have one additional uh, option like condition, but otherwise the syntax is the same. And that's that's one of the things that we wanted to, to achieve so that uh, uh, it would be easier to, uh, to, to write them because they have familiar syntaxes. And uh, all the rule, and basically what you can do is you put all, all, all of your rules or all of your, as I said, logic-based dialogue behaviors in one file. And you can like just manually scanning this file, you can see what your bot will do by default. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, so some are like, for example, mapping policy with trigger actions, it can be, be, be created uh, um, as, as Sasha pointed out. So in the spirit of converting from markdown to, uh, to YAML format, we also created the automatic conversion script from the mapping policy to the rule policy. So it will automatically create the rule snippets uh, for, for you based on the, your old uh, trigger actions uh, in the domain file. So what are the rule snippets? As I said, rule snippets is the new uh, data format for rule policy. It uses this as, as a, it's not really a training data. It's just basically different representation of rules and then it converts it into the, uh, into the dictionary with different uh, 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 JSON strings that it, it, during prediction, it can match, it, it, it uh, applies fuzzy matching uh, to the what is happening during prediction, and if if the match exists, then uh, then it will predict the, the uh, predict the next action. For example, here. So this is the rule where uh, we want to say hello only if user provided a name, and this is what I said. The additional option that we create this condition key is that the thing is that these steps intent greet action at a greet. So the rule policy will predict at a grid anywhere whenever grid is happening. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it is the first in this, for this particular rule, the last or whatever, or it is multiple grids, it will always predict at a grid. But here we can limit this behavior by introducing the condition that the slot user provided name was set. So the, 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 that name was provided, which sets the slot user provided name to true. And therefore this grid at a grid will be executed whenever these two, two, two things happen. And the, the reason why it is not as a slot set event out of the steps is because we don't know at which point the history of the dialogue. 
uh, this this slot was set. Uh, and uh, so it can be set in, you know, in the very beginning and then after five, 10 steps, the user says greet and then we'll still predict the other grid. And you can define uh, different rules for different situations. Uh, the rules are limited to one in 10 because this is the idea. We, the rule policy is not meant to substitute the, uh, the crazy state machines to define, you know, what if, 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 then we encourage you to use stories. But if you have simple things like chit chat or something, then a rules is a good way to do it because then you can ensure that the bot is always executed. And that poses another problem. So if we go to the next slide is uh, that whatever in the rules will be always executed, right? So, it's, so for example, you have a rule intent to chat, action not to chat. It means that whatever in, uh, regardless of the context for this particular rule, if user says chit chat and it intent is recognized as chit chat, it will uh, it will uh, predict the other chit chat, and that creates a very very dangerous behavior, because uh, rules can overwrite stories, but stories cannot overwrite rules. And in order to make sure that your rules don't contradict your stories, we we we, create, we perform an automatic check to detect these contradictions. To make sure that if you have a rule, chit chat, at a chat, but you have a story where after chit chat happens at a grid, then we say, hey, one of the two things are wrong. So either it is this rule is that is wrong because you sh it shouldn't be a rule if you have a case where it doesn't happen or you need to introduce a condition, or your story is wrong because your story is contradicting the rule. And that's that's a tool that is uh, that is, in my opinion, is key for to make these rules useful because otherwise it, it, it can get messy quite fast. And the example, as I said, this contradicting so contradicting rules, it can be contradicting rules when two rules predict different action in the, in the same situation, or it can be contradicting stories. Story, sorry, it's always story or rule that contradicts other rule. So uh, stories themselves, they can be contradicted. We cannot check that. And we just hope that Ted will learn on its own uh, and resolve these contradictions. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And in the same spirit, now the two stage fallback, there is no need for policy. It just becomes another rule. And we also moved out the in the loop fallback from core. So, because in a loop, what in a loop fallback da, does is basically checks whether the intent prediction had a certain confidence, and we, we moved it out to the to the null component because it makes sense for a null component to handle it. And now you can just simply create a rule: if intent is a null fallback, as any other intent like chat, do whatever. It can be some actions, your custom action that you want to do. It could be, uh, it could be the uh, we created a default action, which is introduced it as a, another form of a form. So like a more, one more abstraction level on top of a form, which we call loop, uh, because it's not really a form. It doesn't fill any slots, but it still uh, calls itself. Uh, I know if you used a two-stage fallback policy before, then you are familiar that there are several questions that the bot asks a user in order to uh, disambiguate whatever user uh, input before. And now, again, you can create, a, create a, a rule for it. And the handy thing about it is because you can create your own custom action and do whatever you want after a new fallback. And that's actually the reason why we also, one of the reasons why we create rule policy because the, before you needed to create the new policy <laughs> to handle the fallback. Now you just create a rule and uh, it's, it's much simpler at this point. Oh, can we go to the next slide? Another thing that we uh, uh, change is that, uh, again, as I said, the rule policy will, activate any like so if you need to activate a form anytime users request a restaurant and you don't really care what happened before then you can create a rule for it request restaurant restaurant form active loop restaurant form and you you know that rule policy will always predict it regardless whether it was at agreed at a chat and so on you can of course create story for that but then the thing is that you have multiple different variants before the, the, the request restaurant happened as, the, as, as here in these two examples. You need a bit of variation for that policy to learn that, okay, it, it needs to be history independent. Uh, 
uh, and that's that's another reason. So it's, it's a bit of a fine line when to use a rule, when to use a story. It's it's very custom, so to say. It's, it's it depends from use case to use case. But as a rule of thumb, I would say it's if you need to define something that always happens regardless of the context, or if the context is very limited, like in the, in the example before, certain sort was set, then it makes sense to use a rule. Otherwise, if you have a huge branching logic and you need to create huge conditions, it's better to use a story and train actual policy for it. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And uh, oh yeah, and basically uh, the, 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 that was it. Uh, as I said, there is a different variance. Uh, you can use rules, you can use stories, and uh, the, and but however, and in order to activate the form, because uh, some policy needs to predict this, the first form action. However, as soon as form action was predicted, then as bef then before, form policy took over the job to predict form action again and again and again until the form is is uh, uh, fill all the slots. At this point, this job is done also by rule policy, and uh, and therefore we also change the implementation of the of the form action. Uh, which uh, Tobias will tell you about. Thanks a lot, Wolver. Um, yeah, my name is Tobias, and I'm very proud um, to present our team's work um, on the latest um, of the forms. So back then, when we actually introduced forms in 2018, um, it, that's quite a while ago. It's like two and a half years um, ago now. Um, since then, forms became a vital part of a lot of uh, if not even every mission critical assisted out there. And we, since then, we shipped a couple of iterations on forms. And I'm very proud to present to you the latest um, iteration on forms now. So, what did we change on forms? Karen, could you go, please go one slide further? So, the big change about forms is that we completely re implemented the forms within RAS open source. So um, earlier forms were implemented within the RAS SDK, and now we moved the whole implementation to RAS open source. Why did we do this? Um, there's actually a couple of reasons. The first reason is that you can now quickly implement forms just by writing them in your domain. You don't have to write any code for doing that. And that gives you the opportunity to quickly write form in your domain, train your bot, test it out, and see how this story, uh, how this form actually fits into your conversation flow. Does the form make sense at this point? Um, does it feel intuitive? And then you can customize the form um, later on using custom actions. Also, this makes forms more intuitive to use. So you can now use stories or rules to submit forms, which blends in in your experience, which you already have in writing stories. So this just makes it way more consistent and integrated. And the last reason why we re-implemented and moved the forms to RAS open source is also to strengthen our ecosystem. Before then, uh, the, RASA the form implementation was part of the RAS SDK, and the implementation was kind of bulky. So when you actually wanted to implement your own, own RAS SDK, you had to understand the form logic, and you had to replicate this logic in your own SDK in a different language. I went through the process myself, and I can tell you um, it's not fun. So now, actually, if you want to write custom actions in your favorite programming language, maybe JavaScript, Rust, Go, whatsoever, you can quickly implement your own SDK without having to replicate all this logic. And for example, if your team is very um, proficient in JavaScript, you can use your own SDK there and leverage the existing capabilities in your team. So how do all these changes work? Forms and the stop mappings are now defined in the domain. Previously in RASA open source one, forms, the names of forms were defined in the domain, but now also the slot mappings are defined in the domain. You can see this an example on the right side. So this is a form which is used to book a table in a restaurant. So you have three different slots, the cuisine, how many people are gonna um, sit on the table and whether you wanna sit outside or inside. And for each of these slots, you define how these slots are extracted from your conversation from the last NLU message by defining the sub mappings in the domain. And the cool thing is you can always customize it later um, on. Also forms are now fully managed by the rule policy. So the old form policy is deprecated. So this makes the whole model configuration easier and also enables things like writing stories or rules to submit forms. And last but not least, forms can be customized via custom actions 
just as you know it from Rasa Open Source One. And on that note, I actually want to elaborate a little bit and go on a small deep dive here. Next slide, please. So forms continue to be fully custom fully customizable. This was um, a big concern for us because we know how many users, how many um, customers out there are customizing the forms. And so it was very important for us that they stay fully customizable despite our move from the SDK to Rasa open source. Why did we do this? Um, quite a trivial reason actually. Business logic is complex, unfortunately, and it requires flexible solutions. And Rasa open source can't provide you all the tools out of the box to cover all your use cases. And we need to give you, our users, the flexibility and the freedom to customize um, and add your own um, approaches to this, right? So maybe how you do slot validations, maybe custom slot extractions, or also how you define the custom utterances. Um, how does it work? Um, you can customize all the behavior using custom actions. So you, for example, you can overwrite a custom action to define how um, Ras is gonna ask for slots. You can also override the, how slots are validated or add custom slot mappings. And we also added a couple of helper methods and classes to the Python SDK to make the validation of slots easier. So on the right side, you can actually see an um, example how you would validate slots now with the RAS SDK. And um, you can see that it's actually very in line with how it was done previously. So we hope um, that's not too much of a migration effort for you. And yeah, we try to make it as smooth as possible for you. The next feature I want to present is the suggested config. When you create a project with Rasa open source, you usually start out by using Rasa init. And Rasa init gives you this beautiful small toy project which you can explore and start building upon. And the thing is, it also gives you this model configuration file on the config YAML, which already contains a model configuration with sensible defaults. This is really great to get started, but the problem is, that it doesn't evolve over time, right? So once actually you start building your bot, you actually have to maintain this configuration yourself, which you might not have the time for because you just wanna build out your bot first, first before you actually go into the fine tuning part. And this is what we try to change with our config suggestions in Rasa open source, but too. So next slide, please. So as Alan mentioned it before, it's a, one of Raz's principles to ship applied research to you and to make this research available to you. And we have this amazing research team at Raza, which is conducting experiments every day to come up with new and better components. They're getting insights by running a lot of experiments and trying to squeeze out every last bit of performance and accuracy out of our models. And we want to make these insights available to you. And we want to make these insights available to you independent of whether you're just starting out with Rasa open source or whether you're already using it in an existing project. And this is exactly what config suggestions are there for. So config suggestions means that Rasa will automatically suggest you a sensible model configuration. All you have to do is leave the policies or pipeline keys empty. When you then train a Rasa bot, Rasa will automatically use a suggested config and will also dump this in your config YAML, comment it out as you can see it on this example on the right side. So it's transparent to you what Rasa open source actually used to train your bot. So you can also decide, for example, that you want to keep it or modify it later. And as your Rasa knowledge grows, and if you grow very of this component, if you are like having already this great bot and now you want to actually fine tune it yourself, you can easily opt out of these config suggestions by simply adding your own configuration, removing these comments, and then Rasa will actually hand you over the keys to your model configuration um, so you can fine tune that. Thanks a lot. That was the news on um, uh, config suggestions. And now I want to hand over to Daksh, who's going to present you the retrieval intents. Thanks, Tobias. Hi, I'm Daksh, and I'm here to talk about retrieval intents and how retrieval intents can be helpful while building your assistance and what, have cha what has changed around it for 2.0. Can you go to the next slide? Thanks. So retrieval intents make it easier to handle single-turn interactions. To understand what single-turn interactions are, let's take a look at this uh, example conversation 
which is between a user and one of our in-house built assistants, Sarah. So if you see over here, um, the, the user interrupted the conversation flow by asking a question of their own. And the question was basically around what is the Python version needed to install Rasa? Now, you can categorize these kinds of questions into a category like frequently asked questions. And the thing with frequently asked questions is that you really don't need the whole conversation context to, in order to respond to these questions. And hence, you basically have predefined responses for these FAQs, which you can, which the assistant can reply back with. So retrieval intents collect all such user messages into under one intent, and uh, you, you can have the assistant reply back to these retrieval intents in an easy way. Let's see how you can do that next. So to start off with, you add uh, an intent in your NLU training data. Let's say for the previous example, we add an intent FAQ, but also you add a sub intent um, so the sub intents are basically all different kinds of intents or different kinds of FAQs, which the user can ask your assistant. So in this example, you have two sub intents, the Python version and asking what languages can Rasa support. Correspondingly, you also add which particular, uh, you, you also add uh, response templates for each of these sub intents. So for, let's say for FAQ slash Python version, you add a response template called otter underscore FAQ slash Python underscore version. And note that the response templates start with the same otter underscore prefix, just like any other response template for your assistant. Now, in order to, uh, in order to uh, select the correct uh, sub intent and retrieve the, the correct response for that sub intent, we use uh, we uh, we add a component called response selector in the configuration file and because this logic is more deterministic and we know that let's say if the intent that is triggered is faq then and the then the action should be utter faq we can add it as a rule as how vova showed earlier can we go to the next slide so that's all that you needed to integrate retrieval intents for your assistant and let's take a look at what has changed from 1.x to 2.0 if you were already using uh, the response selector for your assistants. Firstly, the responses for retrieval intents now start with the utter underscore prefix. That means they look very much similar to what uh, the, uh, the other response templates look like. They also now support multimedia formats like buttons and images. They can have more than one variation uh, which will be picked up randomly at, uh, at runtime. And they can also be now defined inside the domain file, uh, just like other response templates under the response key. One other uh, main change is that if you were using response selector back in your assistant, you were also using the special retrieval action which started with the prefix respond underscore. In order to uh, simplify the, uh, the logic behind using retrieval intents, we've deprecated the respond underscore prefix actions. And now what happens is when you add a retrieval intent to your NLU training data file, um, automatically a new action called, uh, let's, say, let's say if the retrieval intent uh, name is, uh, is FAQ, then a new action called utter underscore FAQ is automatically added to your domain file. The third change is how the response selector is trained itself. Uh, earlier, the response selector were used the text of the response that you've defined in order to retrieve the correct response. Now it is trained by using the retrieval intent label itself. So for example, over here, uh, if my retrieval intent was chit chat and there was a sub intent ask underscore name, then the label for the response selector that would use is chit chat slash ask underscore name. And as Alan mentioned previously, this is now a stable release and uh, it's here to stay. <laughs> Can you go to the next slide? Uh, also, so retrieval intents are now supported inside Rasa X as well. You can add response templates for retrieval. Intents. You can create new retrieval intents from uh, the NLU inbox screen or the training data uh, screen. 
and mo uh, most importantly you can annotate the correct retrieval intent for messages that you've received in your nlu inbox uh, with that i'll hand it over to ella who's going to talk about updates to our documentation all right hi everyone um karen if you can get it started Okay, so there have been tons of updates to our documentation. I'm sure that a few of you have um, noticed things have changed when you've popped onto the page and suddenly everything looks completely different. Um, so first off, I wanted to point out if you are still looking for the documentation on 1.x, um, there's a banner at the top that will link you right to the old documentation so that you can find everything. Um, so with that, um, what is new in 2.0? I'll go through some of all of these things um, more in depth. Um, but we've added um, new sections, so new content around best practices, as well as um, some tutorials that are a little more in depth and step by step, um, as well as taking out the action server documentation um, and fleshing it out a bit. Um, some of the new things um, also include the Raza Playground, which we put a lot of uh, work into to make it a really interactive experience to get started with Raza. Um, you'll also notice that there's a new structure to the documentation. So beforehand, it was kind of a very long sidebar of things in vague categories. Um, and now hopefully things are easier to find. Um, that being said, our search function is coming soon. We're working very hard on it. Um, and the new idea behind the structure is that you are kind of splitting into um, the concepts. Um, which are just kind of the different pieces of Raza, the ways that you can configure them. Um, you'll notice that it uh, mostly kind of represents how your Raza project format, um, the directory looks. So you have your training data um, and your domain and your config, et cetera. Um, you can find all the information there. Um, and then separating that out from the section about applications and how to actually take these concepts and apply them to your conversations um, to make the bot have the behavior that you want it to um, and deploy it to production and everything like that. Um, then the last thing is that, of course, it's a new tool, so it's got a completely new look. Um, it also has a new backend format. So if you're one of our uh, contributors to the documentation, um, there's a little bit of change in how that gets written um, because we changed from RST docs to MDX, um, but that's actually probably a format that you're even more familiar with already because Markdown is kind of your typical readme format, so that will probably be easier as well. Um, jumping into some of the bigger things that have changed, um, I mentioned the Raza Playground. Um, this kind of replaces our original page on the tutorial, so kind of the entry point into learning about Raza. Um, and the idea is that instead of just reading about it and trying to gather things, it gives you an interactive playground where um, it will give you an example bot and you can kind of edit the NLU and the stories to your content um, and at the end, in addition to having had a um, interactive experience learning about the different concepts of Raza, um, you can actually take that project that you made and download it um, and use it to get started instead of that Raza init bot. So um, maybe while you're in the middle of your playground, you're already sort of implementing a skill that you want your bot to have, you can take that and use it toward uh, your installation. Um, then I wanted to touch on the tutorials that we have. So some of these came from the very long tutorial we used to have about um, building level two assistants and then pushing them forward to level three assistants. Um, what we wanted to do here was make sure that you could um, implement these sorts of behaviors and skills um, without them relying on each other. So now there is um, a step-by-step -step tutorial for each of these different conversations patterns we have. And they're um, some of the most popular things that people want to achieve with their bots. So how do I answer to chat and FAQs at any point in the conversation? How do I handle business logic? That one will be mainly about forms, um, fallbacks and human handoffs. I know that human handoff is um, a very highly requested tutorial that is now part of our docs. Um, handling unexpected input and contextual conversations are all about kind of stories and rules and how they work together. Um, and then lastly, reaching out to the user, um, which is all about our um, reminders feature and external events. Um, so basically sending messages to the user like notifications when they might not be in a conversation already. 
Um, and each of these uh, tutorials is going to have distinct steps. You can see them on the right there um, for implementing Chit Chat and FAQs. And at the end, it has a summary with a nice little checklist of how to do it. So if you've already been through the forms tutorial once and you don't want to scroll all through the example, you can just jump right to the end and make sure that you've checked off everything on the checklist. Um, we also added sections on best practices. Um, so I think this will touch on some of the questions that people have had with regards to the new rules format and things like that. Um, uh, questions that people have around stories around how do I do context with context switching, um, any confusion around featureization of slots and entities inside your stories. Uh, that's all information that you're going to find here. Um, and the idea is to basically answer the frequently asked questions that we get with regards to how do I write conversation data or how do I generate enough NLU data um, and also how do I do conversation driven development. Um, and this is a screenshot that I didn't include here, but the conversation driven development page has um, information about not only how to um, use CDD once you have your bot in production, um, how to learn from the real conversations there but also about how to implement the idea of conversation-driven development into your development of your initial bot uh, before it goes into production. So I would highly recommend that people check that out. Um, yeah, and then the last major thing I wanted to jump into was the action server documentation. So you'll notice that it's actually pulled out into a separate um, top header bar, I guess. So it's a, basically it's got its own documentation. Um, and the idea was to reflect that, well, the action server is really a completely separate, um, you know, application that your Raza server is talking to just over HTTP. Um, and we wanted to make sure that, first of all, um, everything in the Raza SDK that we have is fully documented and like it's very easy to find. So um, anything that you're going to need to write your custom actions in there as a SDK is all in one place now. Um, and all of the different tracker methods and um, the different things that you can pass to the dispatcher other message are all going to be listed there. Um, it was also really important, as Toby mentioned, uh, we wanted to make it easier for people who are not using the Raza SDK to write custom actions. Um, and part of that has to do with pulling the logic into Raza so that it's easier to implement forms, for example, in another SDK. Um, but part of it is also just making sure that we have um, documentation on how to write these action servers and what the request and response format looks like. Um, what sort of events you can return from an action server and things like that. And so that should all be here. Um, and then the last thing is that we've kept a change log of Raza SDK in the GitHub repository for a long time, um, but it's never been out in the world in the same way that you can easily find the Raza open source or Raza X change log. Um, so now that's something that you'll find in these docs as well. Last thing I wanted to say is that um, obviously the documentation is always developing and we always want to improve it. Um, we have changed a lot with regards to the structure, which means we've done a lot of work trying to make sure that if you click an old link, you're going to end up in the right plate in the right place in the 2.0 docs. Um, so if you find a bug, um, so especially a 404 link or if you're following one of our step by step tutorials and it's not working as it as you would expect it to. Um, you're seeing errors in training, for example. Definitely head over to GitHub, um, make an issue, and let us know, and we can get that fixed right away. If you have other feedback, um, like you have an idea for a tutorial that you think would be really helpful um, that we don't have yet, um, that would be great to hear about on the forum. We have a big feedback um, piece or feedback post on the forum that's pinned at the top, so it's super easy to find. Um, and the same goes for anything, you know, you're reading and you don't, you find it confusing or there's something that's missing, um, things like that. Um, and yeah, with that, I think, um, Yusta is going to also go into how you guys can help and where you can find resources and things like that. 
Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so excited to see so many of you here with us today. And uh, I also looked at the chat uh, during our webinar so far, and I saw so many familiar names of people that I uh, know that have been in the Raza community for years. So it's so great to see you. And um, yeah, I, I would like to talk about uh, things that I think will be relevant uh, to um, uh, Raza community members who built Raza Assistant with uh, Raza 1.x and would like to migrate to Raza 2.0. Um, and uh, also, I would like to share some um, resources of uh, where you can find additional information about Raza 2.0 and uh, Raza things in general, and most importantly, how you can uh, get involved in making Raza 2.0 better. Um, so uh, maybe I'll start with the migration and um, I, I will cover just the main uh, points that are definitely more things. So um, in addition to things that I will mention, you should also uh, check out uh, Raza documentation. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to emphasize once again, you heard about this uh, already before, um, is uh, the change in the training data format. And I think this change will affect uh, probably all of the assistants that were built with uh, Raza 1.x uh, that uh, developers will want to move to Raza 2.0. Um, so uh, Alex uh, uh, covered uh, quite well why we decided to do this and uh, what is the advantage of this change. But the main thing is that if you will want to uh, migrate your assistant to Raza 2.0, you will have to uh, convert your uh, NLU stories and uh, NLG uh, data to the new uh, YAML uh, format. Um, and we want to make this transition as seamless and easy as possible, and that's why as you have heard already before, uh, we have a, a data converter that you can use. It comes with Raza 2.0, and uh, it should help you to migrate your, uh, your uh, training data much easier. Um, so if we can head over to the next slide. Um, uh, here you can see uh, three commands uh, that uh, you should uh, uh, use uh, and uh, keep in mind if you have um, uh, some training data in markdown format and would like to convert that data to YAML format. So uh, the important thing here is that obviously you have to have uh, Rasa 2.0 installed in, uh, let's say, virtual environment. and. Um, um, yeah, if you have uh, existing training data, uh, you can run Raza data convert and specify which uh, uh, data file you will want to convert. Is it NLU, NLG, or core with your stories training data? And then you will have to provide the uh, uh, source directory where your existing training data uh, files are. Uh, right now, and uh, uh, you can specify the target directory where the converted training data files should be stored. Um, um, as you have heard already as well, um, uh, forms um, uh, had quite a few changes. So that's why if your training stories contain forms, there will be some additional things that you will have to um, configure manually. Uh, but overall, these uh, three um, um, commands should help you convert your training data uh, easy and quick. Um, another thing that I think will affect uh, um, most of the systems built with Raza 1.x as well um, uh, are policies. Um, so uh, as well, you have heard quite a bit about the changes in the training policies. So I just wanted to emphasize once again that mapping policy, fallback policy, two-stage fallback policy and form policy, um, um, they have been deprecated and uh, right now they are under umbrella of rule policy. And uh, again, to make the migration easier, you can uh, use a command Raza data convert config, which will uh, update uh, the policy configuration for you automatically. Uh, so for example, it will replace mapping policy, fallback policy, two-stage uh, two fallback policy and form policy if you had them specified in your uh, policy configuration and uh, add rule policy instead. Uh, also, if some uh, of the policy additional configurations you had, for example, an allure threshold for the two-stage fallback policy, um, if you had the, uh, have them in your um, uh, config.yaml file, um, they will also be migrated to Raza 2.0. Uh, again, form policy is a little bit of an exception uh, there will be some additional uh, manual uh, steps that you will have to implement to actually migrate forms to Raza 2.0. Uh, for more details on that, I would encourage you to check out the documentation because, again, it's a big topic, so uh, there will be not uh, enough time for me to cover everything here. 
Um, another change uh, that was introduced in RASA 2.0, uh, which I think is uh, worth mentioning, is uh, that we have uh, uh, a change in slots. So slots type and featureize has been deprecated and uh, we are planning to remove it in RASA 3.0. So in RASA 1.x, um, and the actually previous versions as well. And feature as slot was used for slots uh, that uh, should not influence uh, um, how the conversation goes. For example, how dialogue management uh, makes predictions for the next um, in, um, uh, response. And um, uh, you can definitely do the same and achieve the same in RASA 2.0, uh, but the configuration is slightly different. So in your domain, the YAML file, instead of uh, using unfeatureized slot type, you should use uh, um, slots type text. And then you can use a flag influence conversation to define whether or not this slot uh, should influence how the conversation goes or not. And uh, one additional uh, slight change to uh, slots in RASA 2.0 is that we have an additional slot type uh, called any. And this uh, slot type is useful when you have slots that um, you don't want to specify a specific data type and uh, where you want uh, RASA to completely ignore the slot uh, when it comes to influencing how the conversation goes. Um, so another uh, change uh, that I think will also be useful for developers that used um, Raza 1.x is that there is a slight change in uh, how uh, session management works in Raza 2.0. And this change is that uh, in Raza 2.0, uh, session management is enabled by default. Um, so you can uh, configure this behavior and uh, set uh, a dif uh, different a session expiration time uh, by configuring your domain.yaml file, or you can completely disable the session uh, management uh, if, uh, if you don't want that uh, by setting a session expiration time to zero in your domain file. Um, and uh, also we have uh, quite uh, a few um, additional deprecations and uh, name changes. Uh, so, for example, if you use the uh, event brokers um, in your RASA 1.x assistance, uh, for example, to connect your uh, RASA um, assistance to other services, uh, then we, uh, we change some of the names. So you will probably have to make some changes in your code as well. And uh, some of the dialogue management policies have been deprecated. Um, so embedding intent classifier has been deprecated and uh, it can be replaced uh, with a diet classifier. Uh, and the same applies to Keras policy, which can be replaced with that policy. And uh, one thing that I wanted to note as well is that if you had some uh, configurations for these policies, uh, for example, um, things like max history and things like that and other hyperparameters, uh, they can be uh, used for this um, uh, um, dial classifier or that policy without making any changes to them. Um, so yeah, so these are the most important things um, uh, that I wanted to mention. Uh, definitely there are more things and uh, as, I, uh, as I said, you should check out our documentation and uh, I think this is a good point for me to cover a little bit more uh, where you can find more resources on RASA 2.0 and uh, RASA open source overall. Um, so RASA documentation is definitely should be your go-to place when it comes to learning about uh, new features and especially things that changed in uh, RASA 2.0. We have our migration guide on uh, RASA documentation. So if you just head to rasa.com slash docs, you will also find the link to migration guide there. Um, also, uh, I would encourage you to check out uh, RASA blog on blog.rasa.com. This is where uh, we already shared a few uh, resources on RASA 2.0. So a little bit on migration is already published there, as well as uh, the new features that were added to RASA 2.0. Um, and also we will uh, continue our efforts to create new tutorials, uh, guides, and uh, interesting content overall on RASA and uh, especially RASA 2.0 in uh, upcoming weeks and months. So uh, definitely keep an eye on RASA blog as well as RASA YouTube channel where we post uh, our uh, video content and um, uh, there will be definitely um, more uh, tutorials on RASA and especially RASA 2.0 features as well. And uh, if there is anything you would like us to cover in more detail, if there are any tutorials you would like us to see creating uh, on anything related to RASA, um, please share your ideas with us. Uh, and you can do that by simply uh, posting um, your requests on RASA community forum on forum.rasa.com. 
Um, and uh, last but not least, um, you can get involved in making Rasa 2.0 better. And uh, it's something that I really would like to encourage you to do uh, because all of these changes that were introduced to Rasa 2.0, um, they were made with community in mind and because we want to make it easier for you uh, to create uh, great uh, conversational AI systems with Rasa. So if you try out Rasa 2.0, especially if you migrated your assistant from 1.x to Rasa 2.0, please share your feedback with us uh, on all of the new features and changes like uh, forms and uh, uh, retrieval intents. Um, we would love to hear what you think of them and um, you can share your feedback on uh, Rasa community forum. Uh, again, there is a banner where you can directly share your feedback about the features or you can also just shoot us an email if, you, if that's more comfortable for you at community at rasa.com. We will take that feedback into consideration and we'll definitely um, look into it when we continue making changes to Rasa. Um, and uh, also, I would like to encourage everyone to contribute to Rasa 2.0 uh, because um, Rasa is open source and uh, we would like to see more community members to actually uh, add their input uh, to uh, Rasa open source. And there are lots of different ways how you can contribute. We actually have a contributor program as well that uh, is designed to encourage more developers to contribute to open source. So you can, um, for example, um, report any issues that you face when you use Rasa 2.0. So just like Ella uh, mentioned previously, you can open issues uh, on anything that doesn't work as expected and we will definitely look into it. You can also um, um, suggest improvements and enhancements on uh, Rasa 2.0 and then work on them yourself uh, by opening pull requests as well and Rasa team will definitely support you along the way. Uh, but you can also create educational resources, creating tutorials if you prefer doing that, or making videos and uh, covering, for example, different Rasa 2.0 features, or in general, just sharing uh, your uh, projects with the rest of the community. It's uh, incredibly useful and it's a great way to inspire other people to create, uh, uh, to build great things with Rasa. And um, uh, another way to become a Rasa contributor is uh, uh, helping other community members uh, on Rasa community forum. Uh, so if you see someone asking questions about uh, anything related to Rasa from just migration to how specific features work or why something doesn't work, um, feel free to jump in and, and help your fellow community members to um, uh, built uh, great applications. And uh, one last thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, we actually have a contributor project board on uh, GitHub. So if you just go to github.com uh, slash fasthq and click on projects, you will see this project board. And this is where we add issues um, and uh, ideas for um, different things that we think community could help us out and uh, um, add their input um, and uh, just yeah help us make uh, rather better. Uh, so yeah, I'm personally really excited about Rasa 2.0 and uh, I hope we'll see lots of great assistance built with Rasa 2.0 and even more of you uh, contributing to Rasa open source. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And I think here yeah, I will hand over to Kieran. Cool. Thank you so much, Yusta. Um, so now we have some time for Q&A. Um, have all of our panelists turn their cameras back on? Uh, so we'll get everyone back up here. Cool. And I've noticed that we've had a lot of questions coming in during the webinar. Uh, it's really exciting. We're going to go ahead and run through as many as we have time to uh, live on the webinar. So starting off here, uh, we have a question from Amar. Uh, Sasha, I think I'm going to direct this question to you. Uh, so the question is, uh, can we still use Raza NLU by itself in Raza 2.0? Um, so can Raza NLU still be exposed as just an API instead of building a full-fledged assistant? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. Yeah, the answer is yes. The NLU can still be used standalone as before. Uh, this didn't change. That can still continue working. And yeah, you can find more information in the docs. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Alan, I think this would be a good question for you. So this comes from Isu, um, who asks, are there any added features to answering questions using a knowledge base? Um, yes. So Raza uh, supports 
integrating with the knowledge base to answer questions. And um, if you check out our blog or if you just Google sort of Raza knowledge base, the blog post should come up right at the top. And um, we haven't shipped any sort of you know particular updates to that functionality in 2.0, but it's an active area of research in the research team. So you know, stay tuned. <laughs> uh, and if you have ideas how to do it, please, you know, um, start a thread on the forum or, you know, somehow make yourself heard. Perfect. All right. So our next question is from Vaidehi. Um, and the question is, uh, how do we migrate the actions file or our custom actions from Raza 1.0 to 1 or 1 1.0 to 2.0? Uh, Toby, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so the only thing you actually have to migrate is the, the form actions, which you defined in your actions files. And this you actually have to do manually. Um, we provided a pretty extensive migration guide in our documentation. So I hope this will help you out and we try to do it as smoothly as possible for you. Cool. All right. Uh, Yusta, I think this would be a good one for you. Um, so Oh, I think that's actually very similar. <laughs> Could you tell us about any changes we have to do to our actions for migrating to 2.0? Uh, anything that you want to add to that or? Uh, no, I think I think Toby covered. Yeah, everything is pretty much the same, but definitely form actions have uh, quite, a, quite a few changes. Well, cool. yeah, so we definitely recommend the documentation there. Um, okay, uh, so Vova, um, this question comes from Cobus. Um, so over the summer, we introduced uh, a feature called entity roles and groups. Um, any changes happening with that feature in 2.0 or any changes on the horizon with that? Uh, so in 2.0, no. Uh, however, we are working on, on, so as you know, it is an experimental feature, mm -hmm. which is we are preparing it to do life as not experimental feature, as, an, as a real feature. And for that, for example, we have an open PR to make sure that uh, the core policy can uh, condition its prediction on the roles and groups, which didn't happen before. So yes, um, more updates is coming. Nice. All right. Uh, Will sent us a question asking for uh, any specific time estimates for when we expect Raza X uh, 0 0.33 to be released. Uh, Alan, you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, so I think there's also, I saw a bunch of questions about when there's going to be a uh, Raza open source 2.0 compatible version of Raza X. Uh, very, very soon. <laughs> it's currently in QA. Uh, we've been testing it to make sure there are no bugs um, and it should go out this week. Cool. Yeah, so definitely watch out for that. Uh, Ella, I think I'm going to send this question over to you. Uh, so this question comes from Kieran. And the question is, uh, is there a conversational example uh, that's available for two-stage fallback? Yeah, so um, I talked a little bit about kind of the step-by-step -step tutorials that we have in our docs, um, and there's one of those that's fallback and human handoff. I think um, I mentioned it at one point. Um, it also talks about how to implement the two-stage fallback policy, so you can follow that to implement it. Um, if you're looking, I'm not sure if that's what you want or an example of what that conversation looks like. Um, if you're looking for what that conversation looks like, you can check out um, some of our demo bots. I know our Raza demo, for example, implements the two-stage fallback policy as well. That's a really good point. I know we've already converted a lot of our demo bots to 2.0. Do you want to speak to that briefly? Um, like which bots people can check out to see an example of what the 2.0 format looks like? Yeah, so all of the example bots in our GitHub repository for Raza um, are already migrated. So there's an examples folder, um, and those are usually smaller bots. Our demo bots, like the help desk assistant and the financial demo, I believe are kind of in progress. Um, they've got open PRs that we're working on, um, so you can find them um, in those PRs, or they'll be merged soon. We just had to make sure that um, the code was actually released to get the dependencies in. Sounds good. Um, all right, our next question is, uh, what will happen to bots that have already been deployed using, uh, say, Raza version 1.10 and Raza X? Um, will the new release affect the deployed bots in any way? And Sasha, I think maybe you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So the short answer, nothing's going to happen as long as you're not upgrading. So your existing deployment deployments are not affected at all. But if you want to actually 
switch to Rasa 2.0 and at some point to the corresponding Rasa X release, you need to follow all the immigration guides that we just mentioned about. Yeah, I think that's also a really good point there. I don't know, Yusta, maybe you want to say something too about uh, what would be a good process? Like if you already have a bot running in production, um, like what would be a good process to kind of safely test things out with 2.0 and then make that switch over? Um, overall, I think the best um, first step would be just to make a copy of your project <laughs> for sure and not to start the migration of your production uh, project. Um, so um, yeah, create virtual environment, install Rasa 2.0, make a copy there and then start with the simple steps, converting your training data first, updating policies and then um, making changes to more advanced things like um, let's say form actions and, and everything else that you had in your assistant. Um, we actually just published uh, a blog post on Raza blog uh, covering the same process as well. So that would be my suggestion. Awesome, cool. Um, let's see. So uh, next question, Toby, I'm gonna ask this one to you. So this question comes from Mina um, and it is, uh, where would you recommend putting the NLU and the core threshold for a fallback? Sure. Um, so as Boba already pointed it out, um, the NLU fallback is now detected by an NLU component called fallback classifier. So this is where the NLU configuration, like the fallback for the, NLU, the configuration for the NLU fallback should go. And the configuration for the car fallback should go into the rule policy. If you're already using fallback policies at this stage, then you can also use this new conversion command called Raza data convert config which will automatically convert your model configuration for you and put it in the right places. So you don't actually have to bother with that yourself. Thank you. Um, our next one, we've got a really good question about uh, rules from Daniel. Um, so the question is um, conditions for the rule policy. Is there a way to detect whether there's an active form currently? And then the use case would be that you might wanna prevent rules from figuring during, sorry, prevent rules from triggering during form input. Uh, Vova, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so as I said, there is this uh, condition key that you can put inside your rule snippet, which is can contain whether some slots were set or actually not set. You can also put null there as a value. And the same goes with the active loop. So you can say condition active loop, I don't know, form uh, ask name is active, then do whatever you want to do. Or you can even say, uh, if active loop is none, condition active loop colon none, null uh, in Yaman, uh, do, do something else, which means that your rule will be executed only if uh, the, uh, some form is active or if no form is active. So conditions can be negative. Cool. And uh, I'm going to keep you here for one more question. Um, the question is, how would I include the rule example? So say only say hello if the username is provided. Uh, how would I include that into a story? So is it usable like a checkpoint? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question because we actually had this idea that uh, it makes sense to create this kind of, I wouldn't call them checkpoints. I would call, call them kind of comprehensions. Uh, how it's not implemented yet. So the, the idea is that you would be able to put the name of the rule inside your story, and then automatically Raso Core during creation of trackers will put whatever was in the in the rule. How it's not yet. So for now, you have to actually put intent grid action after grid or whatever was there inside the story. Cool. Thank you, uh, Toby. Um, this question comes from Ganesh. Uh, does the suggested config feature that you talked about, um, does it maximize for certain metrics when it's generating a pipeline configuration for you? It currently does not, but it's definitely something which we are gonna build upon. So to make these suggestions more intelligent in the future. Cool. Um, and let's see, our next question. Uh, I think Docs, this would be a good one for you. Um, so Nicola is wondering if responses could be handled by an NLG server, so like any utterance. Yeah, definitely. So just as you can configure a custom NLG server for other response templates, uh, you can definitely configure that. And what happens is when the, uh, when the action is triggered, the, the template that you the template key that you use for the response template that's sent as part of your post request 
to your customer energy server, which can respond back with the response. Cool. All right. Um, Alan, I think this would be a really good one for you. Uh, the question is from Joel and it's, um, will we be covering cybersecurity considerations? So Joel is a security strategist uh, and researcher, and they're currently researching securing chatbot technology. Uh, anything that you would want to add on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting topic and uh, probably something that's not discussed as much as it should be uh, in the chatbot community more widely. Um, first, I thought the question was about, you know, whether we do security checks on our software, which of course we do. Um, but I don't think we have um, really a particularly, you know, an open conversation currently in the browser community about, you know, cons security considerations for chatbot endpoints. Um, so if you want to kick off that discussion, I would absolutely welcome it. I think it's a very relevant topic. Excellent. Um, okay. So um, next question is from Martina. Um, can we use the GPT-3 model with Raza? Uh, let's see, Alan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, so you can. <laughs> uh, I actually did for a hobby project. So I hacked into actually uh, interactive learning. Um, so rather than me pretending to be the user, I had GPT-3 pretend to be the user. Um, that was a bit of fun if you want to play around with that. So if you have access to the API, you can also use it in a custom action. If you want to try and use it for some chit chat responses, that said, <clears throat> um, I would only ever recommend using this as like a toy or in a hobby project or something like that. I would not ever recommend sort of sending GPT-3 responses directly to your users. Um, it has all sorts of problems. And I'd recommend you check out our YouTube channel and our blog where we talk a bit about GPT-3 and, and give sort of our opinion about why that's not a good idea. Nice. Um, all right, moving on to our next question. Uh, it's from Kieran, and I think, Docs, this would be a great one for you. Um, how good is the response retrieval model for handling hierarchical intent structures? That's a good question. So uh, we've done experiments internally to validate that um, splitting intents into a hierarchy helps, and especially when you're using the re retrieval model, but having said that, I would definitely recommend doing that only if uh, the, the sub intent in your hierarchy is not influencing the dialogue because these sub intents are just for singleton interactions um, and hence the use case is really for them. Cool, uh, one more for you, Daksh. Um, question is for retrieval intents. Once the Raja, Raza agent answers um, the retrieval intent question, um, can Raza go back to the main story flow that was defined? Yeah, definitely. So you can have these, um, ha you can have the intervention of the retrieval intents as part of your stories as well. And uh, then one of your machine learning policies would now learn that if one of the retrieval intent um, interrupts a particular conversation, how does, how does the assistant recover from that? And that would be basically learned from the story that you add. Correct. Cool. Um, our next question is about uh, connecting Raza X to a Git repository. Uh, Ella, I think I'm gonna send this over to you. Um, so does the new version of Raza X, that's a 0 0.33, does it allow connection over HTTPS? Because some company policies don't allow the connection over SSH. Yeah, so that is actually um, HTTPS connection for the Git connection is a feature that we added in 0 0.32 to Raza Enterprise. Um, as far as I know, that's not something that we are have any plans to move into Raza X um, versus Raza Enterprise, but um, we're always open to feedback. So let us know. Cool. Um, okay. So Sasha, let's, uh, let's send this one over to you. Um, in the examples that we saw, um, there's only one rules.yaml file, um, but can that file also be split into modular smaller sections in the same way that you mentioned that the domain file can now be split? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, with 2.0, you can split your training data, rules, stories, anything from NLU, like sometimes lookup tables, regex to different files the way you want. 
and yeah, they will all be picked up by Raza for training. Um, I mean, it doesn't, the main still stays in its own universe. So the only thing, so you shouldn't mix the main and training data, only the utterances, like responses can go in between. But yeah, inside the analytic training data, it's totally up to you now. Nice. Sounds like there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, I'm going to ask this next question to you as well, Sasha. Um, so what about entities? Do you have any recommendations for moving entities from the old nlu.markdown format to the new YAML file? Yeah, that's a great question because we didn't mention that. So basically the syntax for the entities, it remains the same. So um, when you migrate from markdown to YAML, uh, you will see that your examples with entities, they just remain the same, basically. It, does, it didn't change. Cool. Um, okay, so our next question is, um, with, the new with the new version of forms in 2.0, it seems that slot underscore dict is no longer being used, um, but rather extracted entities are now directly added to the tracker. Um, so if that's the case, how do we differentiate extracted entities and validated entities in the tracker? Uh, Tobias, you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, entities were always directly added to the tracker, both in Rasa Open Source and Rasa Open Source 2. Extracted slots, however, from that um, you can validate, um, as you stated. And if you choose to validate these slots using a custom action in, in Rasa Open Source 2.0, then you can, there's a simple helper function um, which we added where you can just call like get slots to validate and then you can get actually all unvalidated from slots and can then validate them um, later on. Cool. Um, we are getting close to time, but I think we have time for maybe one or two more very quickly if people are able to stay on the line with us. Um, Ella? Uh, I know probably a lot of people are wondering about this. Uh, when is it better to use rules and when is it better to use stories? Yeah, so this is one of the things that we had to make sure to add to the best practices docs because they knew it was going to be a common question. Um, so you can find that in the best practices on writing conversation data. Um, the very short answer um, I think Vova kind of touched on is that rules are for things that um, are supposed to be rule-based. Um, so they kind of come from those old fallbacks um, and mappings and forms. Cool. And last one, this is kind of a fun one for you, Alan. Uh, so what is the history behind the name Raza? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, Raza comes from the Latin phrase uh, tabula rasa, which means uh, blank slate. And it's the idea that you don't know anything until you have experiences which for a machine learning library seemed appropriate. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so I know we didn't have time to get to everyone's question today, um, but I think that's all we're going to have time for during the broadcast. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who did submit their questions. If we didn't have time to answer it live, uh, be sure to post your question in the forum and we can continue the discussion there. Um, and yeah, if you haven't tried Raza Open Source 2.0 yet, definitely be sure to check out used as blog post, check out our migration guide in the docs. Um, thanks again for joining us. That's a wrap. We hope you have a great rest of your day.